All right, so here we are in the book of Proverbs, chapter 2. You'll notice, obviously, the book of Proverbs is a book of wisdom. God gives us many things, many instructions, many just real, real life applications, just verse after verse after verse as you go through the book of Proverbs. And we see here in chapter 2, he's kind of given this instruction saying, look, listen to these words, listen to these commandments, because it's going to keep you in the right path and, and so you don't steer in the wrong path. Right? And we're going to spend a lot of time in the Proverbs this morning, but the subject matter at hand, I'm going to, I'm going to point you real quick. You could keep your place here in Proverbs chapter 2, but in Proverbs chapter 29 and verse number 5, the Bible reads, A man that flattereth his neighbor spreadeth a net for his feet. The subject matter this morning for the sermon is flattery and what, being able to watch out for people that flatter with their words. This is a truth, and, and you know, honestly, I haven't really heard this taught very much from the Bible, but it's a very important truth. And as you find in the book of Proverbs, you know, every single mention of the word flatter, flattery, flattering, never a positive reference, not even one time. It's always a negative reference, and it's something that we need to watch out for. So if you want to have wisdom in your life, just in general, read the book of Proverbs. It gives you lots of things to look out for. Watch out for this. Don't go in that way. Watch out. Keep these things in mind, and you'll be able to make right decisions in your life. And one of the things that we have to look out for is flattery. And what is flattery? Flattery is basically when people are trying to really praise you heavily and lift you up and try to make you feel real good about yourself. And look, there's nothing wrong about feeling good, you know, giving somebody a compliment. I'm not talking about compliments here, but when you start getting excessive compliments and people just continue and just go really overboard, that's flattery. They're flattering you, right? Nothing wrong with just saying, hey, you did a good job or, or anything like that. That's normal. But it, you, you should be able to notice and what you want to be able to do is keep your eye out for when people really just start to to tell you how great you are and, and all these other things, they're setting a trap for you. That's what the Bible says. That's what we just read. A man that flattereth his neighbor spreadeth a net for his feet. The, what they're trying to do is gain your confidence and, and make you like them. Right? Everybody likes to receive praise. Everyone likes to be told that they're good looking or they're doing a great job. It, it's something that, that appeals to your, to your flesh. It appeals to your body. It appeals to something that you want to hear. So this is a tactic that people will use to set a trap for you to gain your confidence. If you think about a con man, what does a con man do? He tries to make you, make you trust him, right? He's trying to gain your confidence in him. So a con man's not going to come to you normally, you know, dressed in shabby clothes and just look like a crook, right? Because you're already going to be looking at him thinking like, wait a minute, what are you trying to do here? The best common are the ones that come to you looking really nice, right? They might be wearing a fancy suit and come to you and look like an upright person to try to gain your confidence. These are all different tactics that someone might use in order to lay a trap for you, in order to, to steal your money, in order to steal your goods, in order to do something else. And flattery is one of those things that's being used, and we're, that's a subject for this morning. Now, there's many motives that a person might have to set a trap for you. You know, it might be to steal... But, um, you know, there's, there's many reasons. But there are a few that are a little bit more common in the Bible that are referred to. And those are the ones I'm going to be focusing on this morning. What we saw here in Proverbs chapter 2 is the adulteress. That's the first one we're going to look at. There's also the false prophet that uses flattering words. And then there's also people who are just basically haters of God, just, just reprobate really bad people that are just out to hurt and destroy. And we're going to go through all three of these with biblical references um, so that we can be warned, so that we can be aware of these things. And as we live our life day to day, you, uh, hopefully you'll be able to spot these things and be able to say, wait a minute, what's going on here? At least cause some red flags to pop up so that you don't fall into these traps that are being set for you. Let's look at this first one, the adulteress. Look at verse number 11 of Proverbs chapter 2. The Bible says, Discretion shall preserve thee, understanding shall keep thee. That's the whole point. And he goes on and, and lists many things here. But we need to have discretion and understanding when people come to us. And he says in verse 16, it's basically a continuation of this same thought. In verse 16, To deliver thee from the strange woman, even from the stranger which flattereth with her words. 
The first person that we're looking at that flatters is the strange woman. Now, strange doesn't mean weird, right? Today, we think of strange like, oh, that's, a weird, that's a weird lady there. No, strange means someone who's foreign to you, someone that you don't know. It's a stranger, right? Here's someone that approaches you. You don't know this person. And the strange woman that flatters with her words, you know, you just meet this woman, and all of a sudden, she's just telling you how great you are. Oh, man, you're beautiful. All of a sudden, you say, you know, especially if you're married, you know, watch out for this. Because there are women out there, as we'll see here, that hunt for the precious life. There are women that are looking to find that good man, that pure man, just to defile him and bring him down. Let's keep reading here. Look at verse number 17. It says, Which forsaketh the guide of her youth, and forgetteth the covenant of her God, for her house inclineth unto death, and her paths unto the dead. Let these words sink in. The strange woman that comes to you and wants to tell you how great you are and flatter you and maybe make you blush and, and, and you, know, you think, wow, this woman's really interested in me. Watch out for that. When it, goes, when it becomes really overboard, watch out and just keep this in your mind that is this woman just someone who forsakes God, so has nothing to do with God, and when the Bible says her house inclineth unto death, that's a serious warning. I mean, you can't really get much more serious than that. I mean, her ways are the ways of death. This is not someone you want to have anything to do with whatsoever. Her paths unto the dead. None that go unto her return again. Neither take they hold of the paths of life. Serious warnings to look out for. I mean, this isn't something to take lightly. And guys, you know, you might want to say, oh yeah, she's flattering me, but, I, but you, know, you still want to keep talking to that person. Cut it out of your life. Because you might say, oh yeah, I'm not going to succumb to that. I'm not going to let that bother me. And she just continually over and over and over again can wear you down. And one day you might not be as strong as you were the week before, the month before, the year before. And if you just continually allow and make provision for the flesh and allow for this to happen, you know, one day it, it might actually happen. And this is going to be a serious mistake when you get involved with some strange woman. Now, I don't care if that's committing fornication or adultery. Both are very grievous sins according to the Bible. The Bible teaches us that we need to keep ourselves pure. You are to, to keep yourself pure and virgin until the day that you get married. This physical interaction that people have with each other that it just seems to be promoted these days and it's just acceptable and accepted and you go out to, to these Hollywood weird movies and you go out and watch them and what are they doing? They're portray portraying all kinds of people that they're not married but yet they're going to bed together, they're waking up together and this is just being used to brainwash you and you're thinking, hey, this is normal, this is acceptable but not even 50, 60 years ago, it wasn't like that in this country. People actually had some more higher standards and more morals to live by where they'd look at somebody who says who, who's going to go and sleep around and commit fornication. That person would look at it as a whore or a whoremonger. These days, it's just like, well, that's what kids do. But no, it's not what kids should be doing. We shouldn't just tolerate it and accept it. We need to make sure that we're keeping ourselves pure and, and that we're teaching our children, especially girls, listen up to this. This is important. Because flattery is not just the women doing it to the men. You've got to watch out for the men that, that want to tell you all kinds of compliments just to get you into the bedroom. Now, I know you're really young and you might not understand everything that's being taught right now. But you need to make sure that you keep yourselves pure and in God's word and listen to what he says because... These pathways lead unto death, and it's very serious. You don't want to be caught up with the wrong guy or the wrong woman who's trying to deceive you and lay a trap for you. Let's flip over to Proverbs chapter 6. We're going to see another proverb here about the adulterous woman that flatters, that uses flattery as her tool to get you into her trap. Proverbs chapter 6 and verse number 23 Verse number 23, the Bible reads, For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and reproves of instruction are the way of life. Now, first of all, just let this sink down. You know, a lot of people say, oh, you mean you obey the commandments of God as if it's like some real bad thing. You know, we exalt God's commandments. Why? Because they're light. 
because it's truth, because it's goodness. It's good for you to follow the instructions of the Lord. People say, oh yeah, what are you, some legalist or something? Look, God wrote a law. You want to call me a legalist, that's fine. I just want to obey the law because God gave it to us for our benefit. He knows what's best for us. He's giving us the warnings. He doesn't want you to fall into these traps, which so many people fall into and ruin their lives and make, make decisions that impact the whole rest of their life based off of one really, really bad decision they made in the heat of a moment at one point that changes the course of their life forever. The commandment is a lamp. It's a light for us to, to, to shine and brighten our way to give us understanding so we know the right decisions to make in our life. And the law is light and reproofs of instruction are the way of life to keep thee from the evil woman. God's instruction is here to keep you from this, to keep you from these disasters, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. Lust not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. Sin is always very deceitful. There's always some attraction there that's going to try to draw you in, right? And with a, with a strange woman, with this whorish woman, she may be very beautiful, right? She may be batting her eyelashes at you. She may be telling you all kinds of things that she knows you want to hear. Watch out for that woman, unless it's your wife, <laughs> Watch out for that woman. That is, that's the strange woman. That's why it's called the strange woman, because she's not your wife. Hey, wives, flatter your husband. Right? Tell him how great he is. The only trap you might have to look out for is, okay, honey, can you buy this for me? <laughs> no, this is, this is in regards to the strange woman, the strange woman that flatters with her mouth, right? This is what we need to look out for. Look at verse number 26. It says, for by means of a whorish woman... A man is brought to a piece of bread, and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. This may be a little bit hard to understand sometimes, and when we go over people, you know, in, in, in many sermons, we, we read about people who are wicked people, who are bad people, all the way down to their heart. It can be difficult to understand sometimes for what I would call maybe a normal person, to understand this, right? Now, don't get me wrong. Look, I know we're all sinners today. Every single person is a sinner. And we've all done things that are wrong in our life. But there are some people out there, like the wolves in sheep's clothing, that are bad people whose heart is darkened and, and are reprobate concerning the faith. And they are looking like this. It says the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. Now, there are people that commit adultery that allow themselves to be put in situations and allow bonds to form and end up committing a wicked act. And I'm not going to downplay that sin because the sin of adultery is, is, according to the Bible, is worthy of the death penalty. That's how God feels about adultery and how serious of a sin it is. But that's one type of person that commits adultery. On the other hand, you have women that's talking about here, a horse woman that hunts for the precious life, that she has it out to go out and commit adultery with these men on purpose and is looking to set a trap and to flatter them and just to get them in to her bed. This is the person who's using the flattery and the horse woman that's going to bring you to nothing. It's going to bring you to a piece of bread. The adulteress hunts for the precious life. The Bible says in verse 27, Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? So he that goeth into his neighbor's wife, whosoever toucheth her, shall not be innocent. You want to stay far away from that as possible. Proverbs chapter 7, you want to flip over to the next chapter. We'll see our last reference here for the, for the strange woman, for the whorish woman. We'll continue on to our next flatterer. <clears throat> Proverbs 7, verse number 4. The Bible says, Say unto wisdom, thou art my sister, and call understanding thy kinswoman, that they may keep thee from the strange woman, from the stranger which flattereth with her words. Now look, these are three different references in the book of Proverbs in chapter 2, chapter 6, and chapter 7 that refer to this strange woman that uses flattery. 
Okay, this is referenced over and over again. God's trying to let you know, okay, look, really, <laughs> be careful of these women that are just continually giving you compliments. And especially men that are married, look, it's so common for men to blow things off and just be like, oh, yeah, well, she just, she's just being real nice. Right? And the wife's usually saying, like, I don't want you anywhere near that person. And for good reason. Right? Because usually the wife are, you know, is able to see things a little bit more clearly. Because when you start to receive flattery, often you, you like to receive it, but it could, it could, in a way, brings your guard down a little bit. Because you're thinking, wow, you know, like, I am really great, and this person is recognizing how great I am, right? And that's what we'd like to think. And that's why it works. But that's also why we're being warned about it so many times. Is because, you know, and I'm, I'm not saying if someone gives you a compliment, just be like, get away from me, whore. <laughs> use discretion, use discernment. That's what the wisdom's all about, right? When, uh, <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> When you start to see the pattern, and usually it'll be someone that you come into contact a little bit more frequently, watch out for that. If you're married, you don't want to destroy that relationship at all. And like I said, adultery is, is, is in my opinion, it's like, if not the worst sin, one of the absolute most worst sins that you could possibly commit. Because you're not only affecting yourself, you are severely impacting your spouse. I mean, you are hurting and damaging your spouse and, and Breaking that trust, it, it, it's, it's such a horrible sin. And uh, that's why God gave the death penalty for it. And this is, you know, people might be like, the death penalty, penalty, you know, it's happening all the time. And people getting divorced left and right because people commit adultery. No, under God's law, people will be put to death. And that's a righteous judgment for that sin. It really is. It's a righteous judgment. And that's something that, that today people just kind of blow off. The more things seem to happen, the more prevalent they are. The, the less people really think it's that bad of a sin. A great example of that is lying. Right? The Bible says in Revelation chapter 21, verse number 8, And all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. But today when people talk about lying, it's like, well, everybody lies. Look, I've lied before. You've lied before. So because we've done it, then everyone just seems to downplay the severity of that sin. But even in the Ten Commandments, the Bible taught us, hey, don't bear false witness. Right? If God places a punishment of hell on telling a lie, that's a pretty serious sin. And we need to treat it as such. And just because things become prevalent doesn't mean that we just downplay how serious it is. And adultery is one of those things, unfortunately, in our culture that seems to be becoming more and more accepted. But we as Christians ought to live our life different and separate and say, you know what, I don't care. This world's going to hell in a handbasket, but I am going to use the law of the Lord as my light and as my lamp to guide me through this dark world and to keep me from all of these sins. So we need to have the proper attitude about this and, and never even let yourself get close to committing adultery. So we're in Proverbs 7. Jump down to verse 21. The Bible says, With her much fair speech... She caused him to yield. With the flattering of her lips, she forced him. This is a tool. She says she forced him just with the flattering of her lips. I mean, you think of forcing someone, you don't think of being nice to them, and flattering them. But this is a tool that she uses to force people. She caused him to yield. With the flattering of her lips, she forced him. He goeth after her straightway as an ox goeth to the slaughter, as a fool to the correction of the stocks. Till a dart strike through his liver as a bird hasted to the snare and knoweth not that it is for his life. So the guys that follow after this woman that flatters, he's saying like a big stupid animal, like, okay. And following after, just real dumb, going to the correction of the stocks, not even realizing that there is a, there's death at the end of that. <clears throat> Let's switch gears now. Let's flip over to Ezekiel chapter number 12. Ezekiel chapter number 12. We're going to talk about the false prophet now that uses flattery to deceive and to build a crowd, right? Now what I've noticed just what I've noticed just firsthand, just personal experience, I've seen false prophets start to come up a couple times 
And oftentimes what I've noticed is what they'll try to do is just flatter everybody that comes to them and say, oh, wow, that's great. And we're going to, uh, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself because there's a good example of the Bible too, where um, basically, well, let's start, with, let's start with Ezekiel. I'm getting ahead of myself here. Let's read this scripture and go through this. Ezekiel chapter 12, verse number 23. Ezekiel chapter number 12, verse number 23. The Bible reads, Tell them therefore, thus saith the Lord God, I will make this proverb to cease, and they shall no more use it as a proverb in Israel, but say unto them, The days are at hand, and the effect of every vision. For there shall be no more any vain vision, nor flattering divination within the house of Israel. So here he's talking about these false prophets that use that, that give a vain vision. It's worthless. It's for nothing. It's not from God. And that give flattering divination unto the house of Israel. Basically what this is is saying, everything's just great. You are doing wonderful. Hey, Everything that you're doing is just perfect. Keep it up. God loves you. God's happy with you. No matter what you're doing, this is that positive only message, right? This is a flattering divination. Now, there are many of, of times where you may be doing things great. There's a lot of, of positive messages to preach from the Bible, Amen and amen. The long suffering of God, the mercifulness of God, his, his love and his kindness and, and the fact that he gives us this light and all the guidance and direction that he gives us. There's so many reasons that we could be happy and have a very positive message about God and, and from the Bible. But there are also very many messages that are not as positive to the people hearing them. And the reason why is because we are in error. Because we're sinners and we need to correct our ways. And that there are judgments and there are punishments associated with doing wrong and committing sins. And those aren't the most pleasant to hear. And oftentimes, you know what? That might cause somebody to leave this church because they don't want to hear it because maybe you're caught in that specific sin. And I'll bring up one. I brought it up many times. And it seems like every time I bring it up, I lose somebody. So... I don't know what's going to happen this morning, but the Bible teaches that for somebody who has been divorced already, if you go and marry somebody else, you're committing adultery. Jesus Christ himself taught that. He says that's what's taught in the old law. You are not absolved from that, from that law until your spouse or ex-spouse has died. That is when your vow to that person has ended. You know, it's until death do us part. And when you're married to that person, the only time under God's law you're legitimately allowed to marry somebody else is once that person has passed away. Of course, you know, the Bible says, except for the cause of fornication, and that is prior to the consummation of the marriage because it's not fornication after you've consummated the marriage. After you're married, it's called adultery. Right? Once you're married and you commit that physical act, that's called adultery. So when the Bible gives that one exception of fornication, that's prior to marriage. That is the act that happens prior to adultery. So when somebody, and that's, that gives the example of Joseph with Mary. They were espoused, but they had not consummated the marriage yet because they hadn't come together. They hadn't really completed the marriage. He would have been allowed to put her away in divorce because she was with child. And obviously, except in her case, there's only one way that you can become with child, right? And that's, that's being unfaithful. So that was the only allowance for divorce, right? But that still doesn't mean you're allowed to go off and remarry. When you put someone away, you divorce that person. You are divorced from that person. And Jesus Christ said, look, if, if you marry her that's, that's divorced, you're committing adultery. And um, it's a hard truth. Why is it a hard truth today? Because there's like over 50% of the people are getting divorces. So, so many people that even come into this church, well, I've been divorced already. Well, look, I don't hate you if you've been divorced. I'm just telling you what the Bible says, though, that if you're divorced, don't get remarried. If, you're, if your ex-spouse hasn't been married to someone else, you could reconcile with that person. But you can't just go off and, and get married to someone else. Now, look, I'm not going to get too far into that because it's, it's really straying away but um, this is the point, though. The flattering divination are the people who are going to withhold God's word from you. 
and make you just think that everything's great and roses and that just continue doing what you're doing, God's happy with you. Well, if you're in sin, God's not happy with you. And we need to hear that. We need, we need to know. And, and I don't know about you, but I, for one, when I'm, I know I'm not perfect, but when I'm wrong, I want to know about it. Because I want to get right. That's where my heart is leading me, that I want to be right with God. Look, I'm trying. And if there's somewhere in some place where I'm not doing what's right, God, show it to me. It may sting a little bit, <laughs> but if we have a humble heart and a humble attitude, we can receive God's word and get ourselves right with him and not be looking for these flattering divinations from people. And you know, there's plenty of churches out there. If you just want to come in and feel good and leave just feeling great and then just forget everything and not really learn anything and not really know what God's saying, there's plenty of them out there. But that's not what we're all about here. Turn, if you would, to Jeremiah chapter 14. We have a great example of this. In 1 Thessalonians 2, you don't have to turn. I'm going to quote it for you. I'm going to read it for you. Basically, we see the Apostle Paul just explaining. He says, But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. For neither at any time used we flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness. He's saying, look, we preach the gospel of Christ. We're preaching the word of God. We're not using flattering words. We're not just trying to... to make you feel great about yourself by telling you all kinds of compliments, right? We're just here to preach the word of God and we're not here to please you. I'm not here to please you. I'm here to please God. Now, hopefully it's pleasing to you that you hear the word of God preach. Amen and amen. But you know what? That's not, I'm not, I'm not here trying to say, well, how can I please this person and this person, this person, this person, this person? I'm here to please one person. The Lord Jesus Christ. I want him happy with my service to him. And that's what the prophets are saying in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. You're in Jeremiah chapter 14. We're going to look at verse number 13. We see another example of the prophets that are, that are using flattery to the people and not doing their job. <clears throat> Jeremiah chapter 14 verse 13. The Bible reads, Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, the prophets say unto them, Ye shall not see the sword, neither shall ye have famine, but I will give you assured peace in this place. And if you're familiar with the book of Jeremiah, of course, Jeremiah spans a long time period, right near the end, right before the, the children of Israel were going to go into captivity by the Babylons. The Babylonian government, they came in, they conquered them, and then they took them away captive. So the book of Jeremiah kind of covers this whole time frame from right before they're taken into captivity until they're in captivity. And at the time, the, pro the, the so-called prophets of the Lord were, were giving advice unto the king and his counselors and, you know, and saying, oh yeah, you know, God's with us. We're doing great. We're doing what's right. Don't listen to this Jeremiah guy. You know, he doesn't know what he's talking about. We're, God's going to give us peace. We're not going to have a famine. Everything's going to be just great. This is the message that, that these lying prophets were saying to the people. You'll always have people saying that good message. But let's read here. Keep reading in verse number 14. Because we're going to see the answer of God unto that type of preaching. Verse number 14 says, Then the Lord said unto me, The prophets prophesy lies in my name. I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, neither spake unto them. They prophesy unto you a false vision and divination and a thing of naught and the deceit of their heart. Therefore thus saith the Lord concerning the prophets that prophesy in my name and I sent them not, yet they say sword and famine shall not be in this land. By sword and, by, and famine shall those prophets be consumed. And the people to whom they prophesy shall be cast out in the streets of Jerusalem because of the famine and the sword, and they shall have none to bury them, them, their wives, nor their sons, nor their daughters, for I will pour their wickedness upon them. The reason why the children of Israel were going to captivity in the first place was because of their sin and their wickedness and them turning away from God and worshiping false gods and, and committing all kinds of acts of abomination. 
That's why God brought his judgment on him. Jeremiah pointed that out and says, look, God's judgment is coming on us. It's because of King Manasseh and all the blood that he shed and the innocent blood and they would, you know, they were, they were sacrificing children unto Molech, unto these false gods, and all kinds of horrible things were going on. Yet these other prophets are saying, oh, no, everything's just great. God's with us. And I'll tell you this morning, you know, as a nation, you know, a lot of people say, God bless America and America's so great and we're this bastion of freedom and everyone loves us and God is for our country. You know, I'll tell you what, God is not for our country. He may have been once before. I do believe that he's blessed this country tremendously. When this country stood for the truth, when this country was founded on a rock and actually had a moral compass and actually had this as the compass. But when we live in a society that promotes sodomy, that filthy, abominable act of men laying with men and women with women and saying that this is just fine and we're going to let them run up and down the streets and wave flags and banners and say this is just great. And we have a president that's going to paint, you know, shine a light of, of their, their queer colors on the White House and saying this is what America stands for. And we have babies being killed on a daily basis, innocent blood being shed. Hey, God is not for this country. Not with all of the wicked abominations that are happening. And his judgment will come. Amen. What we can do, because it's not a good message, but what we can do is still keep ourselves separate from this world and, and in obedience to God because God is able to take care of those that believe. He's able to take care of his people and his children and those that are called by his name. He is able to take care of us. But we don't want to make sure we're not getting caught up in all the rest of this world's garbage. And look, we're here to be lights also, right? We're not here just to, to conceal the truth and the wisdom that we have in God's word. Hey, let's let that light shine. And I'm going to be preaching about King Josiah tonight, but during this time frame, we had the King Manasseh was very extremely wicked, but Josiah came along. He was a righteous king. And he didn't get God to change his mind about the, about the wrath that was to come because it had to happen. But he was able to postpone it. He says, you know what, Josiah, in your days, because you've humbled your heart, because you've done all these things that are great, we're going to postpone that. But I'm going to get into that a little bit more tonight. We're in, um, what, what, oh, the last point I want to point out here about Jeremiah 14 is that not only did he say, okay, yeah, you prophets have said you're going to be just fine. There's no sword. There's no famine. He says, well, you're going to die by the sword and the famine. But not just them. He said in verse 16, and the people to whom they prophesy, they're going to be cast out too. So the people are sitting around and listening to these guys and saying, oh, yeah, amen. You know what you're saying is right. They're all going to suffer this. So as someone who's listening to preaching, make sure you're not just listening to someone who's tickling your ear Amen. and telling you what you want to hear. I mean, it may sound nice, but just make sure, is it the truth? Is it what God said? Is it the word of the Lord? <clears throat> now here's where I got finally caught up to the part where I was getting ahead of myself with the, with the false prophet that tries to use flattery. And one of the ways they do that, one of the reasons they do this is to try to build uh, their own congregation, try to get people to follow them, try to attract people to follow after them. There's a good example in the Old Testament. If you want to turn there, you can. Let's go look at one verse in Numbers chapter 16. This is, of course, with Moses in the wilderness. Moses, of course, was leading the people. He was receiving the word of the Lord. Him and Aaron were being used to, to convey God's message unto the people. And all throughout this time, Moses was the leader. I mean, he was the one that was like the chief leader of the children of Israel to guide them through this. And for good reason. God had chosen him to be the leader. He was appointed to be in that position. In number 16, we're going to see a man named Korah. And in Jude, it talks about Cori, the same person. Cori as being the... Um, Use the, the gainsaying of Corey. And what he did was he was trying to convince the people and say, you know, who do you think you are, Moses? 
Who do you think? You are? You know, you're, you're the one that's leading this. And what about all of us? We're all sanctified by God. Aren't we all just, just capable of, of making decisions? Who do you think you are? This is the attitude of course. We'll read that in verse number 3 of number 16. The Bible says, And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron, and said unto them, Ye take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. You see what he's saying there? He said, look, we're all, every single one of us is holy. So who do you think you are that you're lifting yourself up above everybody else? I've seen a, a growing movement today that has disdain for churches that have pastors. And they'll, they'll call the pastor of the church, oh, you're just some hireling. Who do you think you are? What, what do you think, what, what makes you think that you should be leading the church? We're all saved. We're all born again believers. We're all sanctified. We're all holy. So basically, we should all be just leading, right? And now if everyone's leading, there's no leader, right? I mean, a leader is someone who, who's, who's kind of leading the charge, right? If everybody's a leader, then no one's a leader. The trumpet an uncertain sound. Amen. <clears throat> But this is the same type of flattery because what's he doing? He's appealing to the masses by saying, hey, we could all be Moseses. We can all be doing this. Job. What do you think? You're taking too much on yourself. Why are you lifting yourself up? Every single one of us is holy and we're great in God's eyes. That's not what God thought about it though. Do you remember what happened to Korah? God opened up the earth and swallowed him and his family up. I mean, you talk about an answer from God. God was very clear about that. Moses was a, was a friend of God. He was, he was able to talk to God like a friend talks to his friend face to face, what the Bible says. I mean, he spent so much time with the Lord, his face shone. He had to wear a veil over his face because the people just couldn't take it because his face was shining so brightly because of his communication with the Lord. It's amazing. Now, I'm not saying I'm a Moses, but the Bible does call out uh, um, and define the role of a bishop or an elder or pastor, right? Synonymous names used for a person who's leading the New Testament church. And I fully believe that there is to be a pastor. There is to be someone who leads the church. Now, ultimately, the head of this church is Jesus Christ. He is the head. He is the shepherd. And that's why we're an independent church, because... We're not we're getting orders from a denomination head, from any other conference, from anybody else. Our orders come from this book, from Jesus Christ himself. These are where our marching orders come from. And I am here as an administrator to help lead the way and say, okay, here's where our church is going. <clears throat> the Antichrist is going to be another person who uses flatteries. You don't have to turn. I want to get to my last, my last point here real briefly. My, my throat is, is um, holding up well enough, but I want to make sure I get through the last of my points in this sermon. So um, turn, if you would, please, to Psalm chapter 12. But the Bible says in Daniel that the Antichrist is going to come. He's going to obtain the kingdom by flatteries. He's not going to use force. When the Antichrist comes into power, he's going to do it by flatteries. He's going to make everyone else think they're so great and, and, and make them think that they're going to want to give him power. And that's what they do. The kingdoms are going to give him power. They're going to you know, give all their power unto him. And, um, and that's his plan. That's what the Bible um, <clears throat> explains in the book of Daniel. And you know, you think about it, that's also what Absalom did with, from King David. When King David was reigning, his son Absalom he wanted to reign. And when people would come to the king for judgment, he would meet them before they even had a chance to go in and see the king. And he would take their hand, he'd kiss their hand. You know, he would do all these things and say, you know, if I, if I were a king, I would be spending so much time with you guys. You wouldn't have to wait around here and wait to get an answer. But, you know, I would be doing all these great things for you. And, and just making the people feel like, oh yeah, you're so wonderful. Right? 
It reminds me of the, of the politicians today like that, that go up and just say, oh, I'm going to give you this and I'm going to give you that. Oh, just put me in office and I'm going to give you a whole world. And I don't care if they have an R or a D next to their name. They're all saying the same thing these days. Seems to be no difference. But I'm not going to get political now because that's going to just waste the rest of my time. <laughs> Psalm chapter 12. <clears throat> I think I got another cough drop in here. Psalm 12. We're going to look now, lastly, at the haters of God. The people that just hate God and they're trying to set traps for people by using the flattery of their mouth. Psalm 12, verse number 1. Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. They speak vanity, everyone with his neighbor. With flattering lips and with a double heart do they speak. The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips. And the tongue that speaketh proud things, who have said, with our tongue we will prevail. Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? This is the people that want to have nothing to do with God. Who is the Lord? You know, with our lips, with our tongues, we're going to prevail. They belong to us. I'm going to say what I want to say. I don't care about God. Who is Lord over us? The Bible says he's going to cut off all those flattering lips and the tongue that speaks proud things. <clears throat> flip, over, flip back, if you would, to Psalm chapter 5. Psalm 5, verse number 8. Bible reads, Lead me, O Lord, in thy righteousness because of mine enemies. Make thy way straight before my face. For there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is very wickedness. Their throat is an open sepulcher. They flatter with their tongue. Now, this is real interesting. When I was reading this and studying for this Bible, I was looking up all the different mentions of flattery and flattering with the tongue. Here, it's describing a person that flatters with their tongue, right? And it says that their throat is an open sepulcher. And I was like, wait, I've heard that before. The throat's an open sepulcher. Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 3. This is talking about people. It says, look, there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is very wickedness. These are wicked people that we're referring to that are using this flattery of their tongue. It says their throat is an open sepulcher. Romans 3 gives us even more attributes of this person that's being referred to with their, their throat being described as an open sepulcher and they flatter with their tongue. Romans 3, verse number 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together, become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Look at this, verse 13. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. They don't even think about it. They're swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. All of these are more attributes to give you a little bit more of understanding of these people who are using the flattering words. They don't care about God. There's no fear of God in their eyes. They don't know the way of peace. Right? They don't know Jesus Christ. They're definitely not saved. This is talking about a wicked person whose mouth is full of cursing. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Their throats, an I mean, think about an open sepulcher. Just death and, and stink, and that's what their throat is. That's what's coming out of their mouth. Jesus called out the Pharisees as being these type of people. In Matthew 23, he rails against the, the scribes, the Pharisees, hypocrites. He says, woe unto you. And then he goes on and on and on. And he's in, in Matthew 23, he's saying, woe unto you, you scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. And he just rails on them. He says in verse 27, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchers, which indeed appear beautiful outward but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. This is, and it, you know, those are the false prophets too, the Pharisees. They were wolves in sheep's clothing. They came in to destroy. They were plotting to kill the Lord Jesus Christ. They didn't know the way of peace. 
who might have nothing to do with them, their feet were swift to shed blood. On the outside, though, they looked great, right? They, they wanted to command the respect of the people and say, oh, you know, they came in their fancy long robes and they made their great long prayers and they loved the uppermost rooms at the feasts. They loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. But inside, they were wicked, bad people that were out to destroy. And they used the flattery. They even tried to use flattery on Jesus Christ himself. Last place I'll have you turn, Matthew chapter 22. Matthew 22 is the last place. We're almost done. I'm going to wrap it up. Matthew 22. All throughout Jesus' ministry, they are trying to lay traps for him. They're always trying to confound him in his speech and try to, try to ask him questions to which there was seemingly no right answer. This was a continual tactic that they tried to use. If you remember when they brought him the, the woman taken in adultery, this is, this is a verse that causes a lot of confusion among believers. We brought the woman taken in adultery, and this is where people think that like, God's law doesn't really mean anything because he said, let him that is without sin cast the first stone. Right? But when you read that whole story, from the very beginning, the reason why they even brought that woman to her, it's not because they were interested in the truth. It's because they were trying to trap Jesus Christ in what he said. So seemingly, he would have two choices. One choice would be to say, yes, put her to death. Right? According to Moses' law, he could have said that. If he would have said that, the, the, the Jews were not allowed to carry out a death sentence under Roman law. Had he said that, now, read the Bible. It says, it says that they weren't, because that's why they brought Jesus to, to Pilate. Because he said, well, you know, ye crucify him. He said, well, we're not able to. They needed permission from the Roman government in order to put someone to death. Now, there's other crimes they were able to deal with, but not the death penalty. If Jesus would have usurped the authority of the Roman government, boom, they got him. Boom. Throw him in prison. He's, you know, put him to death, whatever, whatever it would have been. Is a trick question. And if he would have said, well, no, she shouldn't be put to death. Well, now you're just saying that you're going against Moses' law. He answered very wisely. He never, he never, he never said, don't put her to death. In fact, he said, throw a stone at her, right? But he said it in a way that, you know, let him that is without sin first cast a stone at her. And he's, make, he's obviously making a point. There's a lot of things going on in that story, but... The point is that they were trying to trick him in his words. That it was a trap. Look at Matthew 22. We're going to see um, where they're trying to flatter him first, trying to butter him up. Again, to trap him because they're laying a trap. Verse number 15. Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. This is their motive. They're trying to trip him up. They're trying to entangle him and get him stuck saying something that's not right or not true. Or they could accuse him of something. Verse 16, And they sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master, we know that thou art true and teachest the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. Aren't you so great? You don't care about people. You know, this is what they're doing, right? They're, they're laying their, their they're setting their trap, trying to make him feel, we know that you're, you're this awesome teacher and that you don't care what anyone has to say or think. Tell us, therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? He knew what they were trying to do. Again, he tried to say, Hey, are we supposed to pay taxes or not? Another trick question, right? Because they're trying to get him to say, Well, no, and of course, no, then he's going to be arrested as a, you know, not, not paying your taxes. But he had already mentioned before, and we could see other examples where he says, look, the children are free. You know, the, the government's supposed to be charging taxes of foreigners and of strangers, but not on us. And that's the way it's supposed to be. And he said, nevertheless, yet, lest we offend him in a different story with Peter, when he said, does your master pay taxes? And Peter's like, yeah. You know, he didn't know what to say. He was kind of caught off guard or whatever. And Jesus is like, look, we don't need to pay taxes. But go ahead, pay them their stinking money. You know, we don't, we're not, that's not our fight. We don't care about that. Just give them their money and let them be. Basically is what you say. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but that was what you're saying. So here they're trying to, to get trick him again, saying, look, is it lawful? Should we pay tribute unto him? And he answers wisely again. Of course, he says, well, say, you know, whose image is that on this piece of money? Oh, it's Caesar's. Okay, well, give to Caesar that which is Caesar and give to God that which is God's. 
That was his wise answer. The whole point of this sermon this morning is to watch out for the people that use flattering lips. This is what I want you to walk away with this morning. Just, just be aware of it in your life because it can be easy to blow things off. But I want you to be able to, especially when it comes to the adult, that's why I went through that one first. It ruins, I mean, it ruins so many people's lives. And it's used so often. People just trying to, trying to make someone feel real good about themselves to get their foot in the door to, to end up causing that wicked sin. Proverbs 27, 12, you don't have to turn there. The Bible says, A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. We want to be prudent. We want to be able to see this stuff in advance. See the coming down the road. You see the person just, just buttering you up and, and just, what are you trying to do? Salesmen use this tactic all the time. They'll try to tell you how great you are and all the other stuff. Be aware of it. I mean, they're not, they don't care about you. They care about making their sale, right? Now, that's a much more mild form of this, but just be aware of this tactic that's out there and, and be able to separate yourself for a minute Instead of just receiving all this praise, right? And if you have a humble attitude, it's a lot easier to do that. When you don't just think of yourself as being this, this awesome, great person and lifting yourself up and thinking so highly of yourself, when you have that attitude, you're a lot more likely to receive that praise then because it's, it's that self confidence Oh, yes, yeah, I am great, right? You think so too. <laughs> now there's two of us. But when you have a humble attitude and you realize, you know what? I'm, I'm just a sinner. I'm not anything special. And I'm, and I'm trying to help other people out. When you have that type of attitude, it's a lot harder to, to fall into this trap. So let's keep that humble attitude. And um, hopefully you'll be able to watch out for the flattery and be able to hide yourself from that evil. Let's uh, bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for giving me the strength to get through this message this morning. Pray that you would please give us all that wisdom. Help us to be prudent, dear Lord, and to watch out for the flatterers, for the, the wicked people out there, dear Lord, that are just trying to hunt for the precious life and try to cause us to, to sin and get involved in serious iniquity, dear Lord. Pray that you please give us that wisdom. And um, we thank you for your book of instruction, dear God. Help us to continually change our life to be more in compliance with your words. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.